Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Norton Rose Fulbright's YouTube channel, Energy Transition, the Pace of Change. I'm Kevin Mayer, a partner in our Los Angeles office, and I have the pleasure today to be joined by our good friend and colleague, George Gitchell, the founder and CEO of Echo Hub LLC, a transitional waste to energy and recyclables company. George, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Why don't we start off by having you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about Echo Hub. Certainly, thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is George Gitchell. I'm the CEO and founder of EcoHub. And this company is a revolutionary company that is backed by 27 patents and counting. I am the sole inventor on the system, which is a mechanized, fully automated sorting system that sorts mixed waste from any source, whether it's a residential home or a commercial business, into every single constituent element of that waste stream. So all the different grades of paper, all the different types of plastic, metals, glass by color, food waste, yard waste, animal manure, diapers, textiles, wood, yard waste, food waste, et cetera. So all the different materials that are in the waste stream goes through this mechanized sorting process and come out as feedstock streams that are then used to manufacture sustainable products or convert into renewable energy or renewable fuels, potable water, and food. It's really a fascinating technology that you've developed. And as I appreciate it, George, you have the ability to capture virtually 100% of the human garbage stream, both organic and inorganic. Is that right? That's correct. So the system is really based upon the law, laws of physics, where it separates all these different materials in the waste stream uh, by their physical prop properties. So size, uh, dimension as in 2D, 3D, optical properties, magnetic properties, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and really this was born 25 years ago. I started out in the recycling industry uh, oh, almost 40 years ago <clears throat> and got into renting waste handling recycling equipment. And once I had developed that kind of a program, I had 125 independent dealers representing me throughout the continental United States. And after that, I started looking into what was in the commercial waste stream and saw that you know, most of it's recyclable and, and then started developing mixed waste sorting systems and then started my own hauling company that would pick up compactor boxes and debris box containers full of dry commercial waste. And we would sort through those materials and then sell the materials into the market avoid landfilling and that kind of went from there into when recycling started uh, becoming more more and more popular about 30 years ago started getting into the design of systems integration development where i designed the essential systems that are now what are called single stream recycling systems where you put all your recyclables in one bin and then they're brought to a recycling facility where all those materials are sorted into the individual streams and then sold in the marketplace after I had done that, I didn't know anything about patents at the time, and I developed the first couple of systems. And before I knew it, there were about six different companies manufacturing the exact same processing system for single stream recycling. And several years later, I encountered a company that was trying to do a waste to fuels play where they would take certain elements of the garbage stream and then try to convert it through gasification into renewable fuels. And they came to me because I had vast experience in systems integration and they asked me to design their front end. So the, the system that would essentially pull out certain elements of the waste stream and then enable them to use those feedstocks to gasify and then convert into liquid fuels. While I was doing that, I thought, you know, no one's ever really done anything like this. And I contacted a patent attorney and I said, would you mind running a worldwide patentability search on this? Which he did, he came back to me about a month later and he said, George, this is like the wild, wild west. There's really nothing in this space. I said, well, that stands to reason because the businesses or companies in the space that make the most amount of money are the, the guys that own landfills. So their whole system is to put everything in the landfill, not keep everything out. So once I had seen that there was an opportunity to do a patent on this waste of fuel system that I was trying to develop, which was a system that was fairly simple in nature, what I was trying to do is pull the 
wet organic and dry organic streams out of the waste stream so I can have a wet organic fuel and a dry organic fuel. So in other words, separate the food waste and the yard waste and the animal manure, and then separate the paper, plastic, wood, textiles, and rubber, which are the dry organic waste streams from the inorganic waste streams, recover metal and glass, and therefore get to a high recycling rate, but have two distinct fuel streams that can be used through conversion processes to make uh, renewable power or liquid fuels. So once I had developed that system and applied for a patent on it, I thought, you know, how about going further? Let's look at what's in the waste stream. And essentially, if you look at garbage, it's a combination of all these different materials, but really it, it's about 85% carbon-based. So if you look at traditional recycling, for example, certain types of paper, cardboard, certain types of plastic, glass, and a couple of different types of metals are what are traditionally considered recyclable because there are markets for those materials. They're, they're pulled by consumers or by businesses and they're, they're put into containers and then they're separated and then they're sold to brokers and mills that then convert them into new products. So paper obviously goes back into paper products, whether it's cardboard boxes or different types of printing paper or copy paper, that sort of thing. And then plastics can be made into new plastic bottles or plastic packaging material. Metals obviously are used to make new metal products. Aluminum cans make new aluminum cans and glass goes into either glass bottles or into insulation products. But what about the other things like wood, like textiles, like diapers, like um, food waste, yard waste? Now there's some programs in the country that are separating yard waste and composting that material, which is a good use. Some now are looking at adding food to that mixture. But the problem when you, when you take food waste and you take yard waste and you put it through composting, you still create methane, which is really bad for the atmosphere, and you lose the water that's contained within those materials. It's, it's anywhere from 60 to 80% water-based, and you also lose the energy, the carbon in there. So you're creating a compost material, but you're, you're losing energy and you're losing water. So my whole concept in looking at that is, let's take everything to the highest, best use. So again, looking at what's in the typical waste stream, it's approximately 30 to 35% food waste, yard waste, nano manure, wet organic material. Paper is somewhere in the 25% range, plastic sometimes in the 14 to 15% range. And you've got actual diapers that are four to 6%. You've got wood at 4%. You've got metals at about 7%. Glass is about 5%. Um, what about all those other things aren't traditionally considered recyclables? Well, if you were to take all those materials out of your waste stream and put them in the separate piles, um, they could all be used as a feedstock to make something new. So my concept was, all right, if everything in the waste stream can be used as a feedstock to make something new or to create renewable energy or to extract water, um, why not try to figure out a way to mechanically separate all those different materials into very pure streams of feedstock so that you don't have to ask people to separate it. You don't need multiple collection routes to pick it up. Because if you look at the traditional um, waste recycling business model that's been in place for 40 years in America, what you have is the waste companies that own landfills that get contracts to collect waste. And then on the residential side of things, they'll put recyclables into a separate container and then they'll put yard waste into a separate container. So it's a three route system. And you're asking residents or businesses to separate these different materials, which they never do efficiently, put them in these three different containers and the, the garbage ends up going to the landfill. The recyclables go to a recycling facility where they separate them and sell them into the marketplace. And then the, the yard waste goes to a composting facility. So you have all that carbon, you have all that cost of collection, and you have all that in, inefficiency because people don't know how to separate very well. If you just look at the recyclable side of things, usually in the United States, these curbside recycling programs, which are called single stream recycling programs, will have between 10 on the low side and 40% on the high side garbage mixed in with the recyclables. So you're picking those things up separately, then you have to spend a lot of money separating the garbage out, and then you're losing all these different material streams, and it's very expensive to the end user or the customer, whether it's a commercial business or a residential account. So to me, that just seemed very, very inefficient. So what I did is, I started thinking about looking at all these different materials that are in the waste stream 
and trying to figure out a way to use conventional technology arranged in a very unique way um, through a process to mechanically separate all these materials. So it took me a while to figure that out, but using conventional equipment, I was able to do it. It's now a 90 step process that uses shredders, size separators, dimensional separators, uh, density separators, and optical sorting systems using near infrared technology, x-ray technology, camera technology, and, and then induction sensor machines for different types of high grade metals, magnets, and eddy currents that separate non-ferrous materials. So all these different machines arranged in a very unique way in this huge system where you take this mixed waste in one container, whether it's a, from a residential uh, account or a commercial account, it goes into this system and it comes out at you know 95% plus pure of all the different grades of paper, all the different types of plastic, all the different types of metal, glass by color, food waste, yard waste, animal manure, wood, textiles, rubber, um, <clears throat> diapers, inorganic material, electronic waste, household hazardous waste. Literally everything gets separated in very high purity streams. And what I did, you know, once I started applying for patents in the US and internationally on the system, one of the things that I learned is that probably 90% of the things that are patented never see the commercial light of day. And the reason for that is it might be a really cool system or a very cool machine, but it doesn't make money. So therefore it can't go out there and be commercialized. So I knew that once I had come up with this design using all this conventional equipment arranged in a very unique way in this process, I had to go figure out a way to get uh, the manufacturers of those individual pieces of machinery and the systems integrator that was gonna build the whole system to guarantee the performance so I could go to banks to get loans to build it. So that involved a very long process of about eight years of time where I actually created a mass balance algorithm and I took every single material that was in the waste stream and I, I made up these 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches box to come up with one cubic foot of weight of all these different materials. So I knew what the bulk density was of everything con contained within the waste stream. And what I found, which is something very interesting, is that in the U.S. waste stream, there's about 40 different items in it, and they all fall into four different density categories. So the idea behind the system was, okay, let's try to size reduce everything as it comes in so that we have 10 inches by 10 inches or smaller pieces of material, because that's the only size that you can, it has to be 10 by 10 or smaller to mechanically sort it. So you have to sort it by size, then take the oversized stuff and shred it down. And then you run it through a series of screens and density separators to break it into four different density categories. And then you, you can run it through all the different recovery technologies to recover it. So I took this process flow diagram that I had designed of the whole system. And then I took the mass balance and plugged in all the different materials that we were going to separate and then I went to each individual manufacturer and I said, here's your machine. Say it's a magnet to recover ferrous metal. At this magnet, you're gonna see this flow rate of material. You're gonna see this composition of material. You're gonna see this bulk density of material. And I want you to guarantee me that you're gonna get 95% of all the ferrous metal at this position out of the system. So they said, okay, we'll do that. And then I went to every single one of the 90 step <laughs> technologies and did the same thing. Then I went back to the systems integrator and I said, I want you to guarantee the entire system so I don't have a he said, she said deal and guarantee the whole system to do this kind of performance. And I got him to do it. And again, it took eight years. It's unprecedented. It's never been done before, but I got it done. So I got a full guarantee of this entire massive system that will run 2000 tons a day of garbage through it to extract all these different feedstock streams. Once I had George, done that- let me, let me ask you something then. Sure. In light of the, the business of Echo Hub and the technology that you've described, what does the energy transition mean to you? And how is this impacting your sector, the garbage sector that you're working in? That's a great question. So once I had developed this sorting system, then I said, okay, now I've got all these feedstocks that come out the back end of the sorting system and recovery system. Now I need to go out and find technologies that I can bolt onto it. So think of the sorting system like a smartphone and think of the technologies like apps. So the whole idea was to develop a, a, a library of technologies that could bolt onto the outside of this sorting system on the same campus 
and take all those materials of the highest best use. So let's talk about energy and renewable energy. Remember, I started out by saying that 85% of the materials in solid waste are carbon based, right? So if you take the food waste, the yard waste, and the animal manure, which is about 35% of the waste stream, and you run it through a process called anaerobic digestion, which is basically like a steel stomach. It's a big tank. It's got micro uh, bacteria in the bottom of it that when you prepare the organic materials properly, you add some water to that and you put it into this tank and the bottom of the tank, there are these microbes that eat the organic material. They produce gas like we do. They produce liquid and they produce solids. So the gas comes out the top of the tank. It's cleaned or conditioned. It runs through IC engines to make renewable power. Then you've got the water that comes out that is purified. And then you've got the solids, which are fertilizers. So instead of making compost, you can make an enormous amount of energy off of that material stream, okay? You've got also got elements like wood in the stream and you've got textiles in the stream. So those two materials can be put through a process called pyrolysis and converted into a syngas, which then is converted into renewable energy, okay? We take paper, we make it into new paper products. We, we take plastic, we make it into new plastic pellets. Plastics can also be pyrolyzed, some of the low grade plastics, like numbers three through seven or film, and, and they can be converted into a syngas, into a uh, pyro oil, into a renewable fuel that is a sulfur free diesel product and into energy. So you could actually take the paper, you could also take uh, the plastic, and you can make renewable energy out of it if you want to. That's not the highest best use, however. The highest best use for paper is to stop cutting down trees and use it as 100% recycled content new paper products. But you could plug and play whatever technology you want on the back end. In America, what we want to do is take the paper and make it into new paper products. That's the highest best use for right now. But if you're going into the developing world, for example, the developing world it's about 60 to 80% wet organic material, 10 to 15% film plastic, and 5 to 10% inorganic material. That wet organic material causes massive health problems in the form of leachate, which is the bacteria laden water that breaks down in, when the organics break down. Methane, I mean, I actually have film of met, methane being produced in landfills eight hours after the material was dumped in Southeast Asia. So we can put a system in there to separate the wet organic from the film plastic from the inorganic, reduce all the health, health problems associated with environmental damage and turn it into renewable energy, water, organic food, okay? So if you look at the whole EcoHub campus in, in America, we can have up to 25 different technologies that bolt onto the back end of it. One of the interesting technologies that we have is to take that wet organic material, that 35% of the waste stream, make renewable power, water, and fertilizer, and then bolt on greenhouses and indoor growing facilities to grow organic food. We can grow shrimp, we can grow organic food, all completely 100% off the grid. And one of the other things is we produce so much energy at the EcoHub that we're completely off the grid. So this huge, you know, million and a half square foot manufacturing complex is completely off grid and we have excess power that we can sell into the grid, okay? So that's one of the ways that we help. The other way that we help, and this is really, really important. You know, there's all this talk about climate change now, we have to reduce our carbon emissions and all that other stuff. And everybody's very concerned about that. Well, if you look at manufacturing a product from raw materials, like an aluminum can, or let's, let's take a plastic bottle, for example. You're extracting oil and gas from some faraway place. Then you're putting that, 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 that oil into a tanker or into a pipeline or into a truck. And you have to transport that to a refinery, which is far away. Then you have to use a lot of energy in that refinery to crack that, uh, that oil into the various subgroups. And then you have to convert that element that is the plastic bottle, that type of plastic into a gas, into a liquid and into a pellet which is a lot of energy. Then you take the pellet and you bring it to a bottle manufacturing facility. They blow a bottle, which is more energy. Then you transport that bottle to a bottling company where it's filled with liquid and it's cased and it's put onto another truck. It goes to the distribution warehouse and it goes 
to the grocery store, then you go down there and buy it, you consume it, throw it in the garbage, it goes into the landfill. Now with EcoHub, that same plastic bottle is recovered and then made into a pellet and could be made into a bottle on the same site and sold into the local economy. So what we found by doing our own calculations is the EcoHub, because of this closed loop manufacturing process, actually it's a four to one reduction in carbon emissions for every ton of garbage. So one EcoHub at 2000 tons a day of garbage input would save 2.5 million metric tons of carbon emissions. In the US, we could build 734 of them to handle and process the 460 million tons a year of waste generated above ground and, and reduce the carbon footprint of the United States by 1.88 billion uh, metric tons per year, which is about 30% of the entire US output. So, you know, you have an opportunity to capture all that carbon, to reduce the amount of energy used to make new products, to get the entire country to zero waste and create millions of jobs and trillions of dollars worth of economic activity to usher in the circular economy without harming the oil and gas business one iota, without harming the environment, in fact, protecting the environment and doing the right thing from a green perspective from carbon emissions reductions, all without any kind of government subsidy whatsoever. That's the beauty. Well, let me ask you, it, I mean, that's extraordinary when you think about it, the, the effect that this could have. So what do you see as being the biggest opportunities and the biggest challenges to you over the next five years? Okay, so the, you know, the, 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 the biggest hindrance for us has been the fact that you have a very well-established group of industries that you have the solid waste industry, you have the paper manufacturing industry, you have the plastics processing industry, you have the consultants that work with them. And they've had a business model that's been in place for almost 40 years, where it's a for residential collection across the United States. It's typically a three route system where you put your garbage in one bin, you put your recycling in another, put your yard waste in another. It's picked up by either cities or contracted private haulers. And right now, the US EPA says that there's about a 30% recycling rate. It's really like around 20% recycling rate with about 10% composting rate. That's what they say, but that's not really the case because you look at the two largest waste companies, waste management and public services, and they handle about half the US waste stream, which is about 225 million tons for them out of the 460 million tons generated every year. And on their websites, they, they say that they're recycling between two and 5%. So if the two biggest companies that have half the US waste stream and probably 80% of the recycling facilities are doing two to 5%, we're not really at 20 or 30% nationally. That's the reality of the situation. So the, the biggest obstacle that I've been in, and remember with our system, you can put everything in one bin. You don't have to sort anything, whether you're at a residential or commercial business, you just put it in one bin. And so for us, we're a huge threat to the status quo business model. We're a huge threat to the recycling programs. We're a huge set uh, threat to the paper manufacturers that buy recycled materials from these big companies. We're a huge threat to the landfill and filling of landfills with garbage. So we're disruptive in every single way. And I knew that going into this because I've been in the business for 40 years. So you know, literally 15 years ago, rather than trying to cross swords with these big companies, I went to them and said, can we work together? I'll build these eco hubs at every one of your landfills. I'll pay you for your garbage. We'll make more money. And, uh, you know, we can protect the environment and do the right thing and everybody wins. And it's a long and tough story. But, you know, over all these years, I was brought to the altar many times by them. And at the end, they said, no, we're not interested because you know, I can't explain it other than to say that I, I'm too much of a threat and maybe they fear that if I built one eco hub with them that I would make so much money that I'd be more powerful than them. And the bottom line is, and this is the reality of the situation, those big companies make an average of $40 per ton in EBITDA profit, okay? 75% of that or $30 of that comes from collection and 25% of it or $10 comes from processing and disposal. We make $500 to $5,000 per ton of taking these materials out of the waste stream and making new products or renewable energy out of it. So, you know, that's a force multiplier differential 
And I think they probably fear that if we build one plant that we're gonna to try to take them over, which was never our intention. We wanted to work together, but for whatever reason, I've had to fight this battle for the last 15 years. And then when I go to cities and try to propose this, I, I've always gone to the garbage companies first and said, let's work together. When they say no, I go to the cities and then I get caught up in um, relationships, political relationships they've had because you know, when you think about it, if, if you live in a city and your house gets broken into and you, you call the police and they don't show up and then you call your council person, you say, hey, listen, you know, the cops didn't show up to my house. I got burglarized and you're upset and the police don't do anything. You're calling your council member or the mayor if you have a relationship and you're saying, hey, come on. Think about it. If you don't get the garbage picked up in the neighborhood for a week or two everybody's calling city hall going, what the heck is going on here, right? And so these contracts have been in, in place for decades, either for disposal or collection. And so there's a lot of very close relationship. And, and when somebody new comes along that's disruptive, nobody wants to do that because these relationships are already in place. So let me, let me ask you a hypothetical, George, and see if you can answer this in a okay. minute or less. I live in Los Angeles, you live in Houston. If Echo Hub built plants in these cities, what would happen? What would be the result? The, the result would be just one plant, Kevin. One plant going in where we could go in and, and let's, let's go back to the cost of the customer, right? So the, the residential customer in, in Los Angeles for a 90 gallon can pays about $110 per month to get that taken away. And that includes the recycling and the composting. Okay, if, if, if you did a two route system or a one route system, your cost would probably be in the $20 to $25 range. So it's, you know, five times less expensive, six times less expensive to do, do it our way from a residential standpoint. Same thing goes for commercial waste. Instead of paying for landfill, you get a credit. So if we built one plant, in one city, let's take Los Angeles. And Los Angeles could probably handle 20 of these large eco hubs. And I've talked to the city of Los Angeles about this way in the past, right? But if we built one plant there, every single city in California, every single city across America would say, I want one of those. Why wouldn't they? We can reduce our costs to our customers by two, three, four, five hundred, six hundred percent. We can get to zero waste or 100 percent recycling. We're gonna add thousands of green new jobs. We're gonna bring billions of dollars into the economy. We're gonna clean the environment and reduce the carbon footprint by 30%. It's kind of a no brainer to the you know horse and buggy way of doing things in the 20th century. So that's the big threat. Like one ends up being 700 plus across the country, just one. And that's why it's been such a difficult fight because I think all these industries combined know if I build one plant, you know, it's game over. And that's George, the only way to put it. I mean, that's true. Listen, I, I, re I very much want to thank you for taking the time today to, to join us and explain all this. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you as well for listening. If you want to hear more about energy transition, by all means, please subscribe to our channel and don't miss the next episode. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.